So um, our third panelist hasn't made it on yet. Hopefully he is finding his way here. Um, but let me give you a little outline of what we're going to be doing and introduce you a little bit more to the Nova Sutras movement. And then um, we'll see what happens. So I'm gonna share screen with you for just a moment. Uh, don't panic, it's not gonna be all PowerPoints, but just to uh, show you a little bit of, of what we're up to. And of course, because we have a very long and complex title. Uh, <laughs> so we've called this session Empowering Earthlings, Awakening the Body-Mind with Forest Immersion. And uh, as I said in the earlier intro, a lot of this is about making sure that we have the strength for the challenging work ahead of us when it comes to building world unity, when it comes to coping with the climate crisis, when it comes to coping with extinction crisis, yeah, just when it comes to um, facing um, social justice crises, all of these are deeply interconnected and all of them are very taxing on the people who get involved. If we're going to succeed, those people need to have as much strength as we can lend to them. And part of the commitment of Nova Sutras is to find practices that help people build that strength to move on. So um, today I'll be talking along with Dr. Kenan Smith and our good friend, Paul Schafsma. And I'm going to give you a little introduction to forest bathing, to the science behind it, what it is, how it works. Paul will talk a little bit more about the kinds of experiences that you might expect and encounter during forest bathing. And then Kenan is going to uh, give us insights into the, the psychological functioning of that, really where that comes from, what it is connecting with in us, and how we interact with that. Um, so, sorry, Paul is contacting me to try to get on and doesn't know where the link is. Um, okay. Before we get into the details on Shinrin-yoku, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about the Nova Sutras movement, and in particular, these two foundational concepts for our movement, what we call Agaya and Ubuntu. Ubuntu you may have heard of, um, Agaya you probably have not, unless you've been on Nova Sutras events before. So Agaya is a new word that is a fusion of this term Gaia. In the sciences, the Gaia theory is a recognition and articulation of the way that life creates conditions that promote ever more complex and resilient life. It's the process of evolution, the integration of feedback loops that make life this incredibly powerful co-creative force on the planet. Um, so much so that it would be evident to anyone looking for life on earth that we have it just because of the chemistry of our atmosphere. The whole planet has been transformed by life.
in Nova Sutras, we, we recognize, we've come to understand that that, that incredible co-creative power is also an expression of love. And the term agape is a term that's been used to, uh, to articulate transcendent, universal, sacred love. Um, Kendon has used the term atheism, that what is happening when we connect with the beauty of nature, that feeling of wonder and reverence, this is us really linking in with this deep feeling of love. Part of how that deep love is expressed is in what is called Ubuntu. Ubuntu comes from the languages of Southern Africa, and sometimes they define it as I am because we are. It's this recognition that humans can only be themselves because of their interactions with other humans. And when we look at the more than human world, we find this principle is true throughout all of life. Humans are specialists at this. We share information, we learn from one another in so many ways that we cannot be fully human without interacting with other humans. But it's also true that we couldn't exist at all if it weren't for trees and ocean algae producing oxygen, if it weren't for the plants that produce the sources of all of the food that we eat. Those plants wouldn't be thriving without the microbes in the soil, without the fungi. Plants that produce flowers and fruit are also extreme specialists in Ubuntu because they count on these animals, these other species, to make their reproduction possible, to pollinate them, to carry their seeds around. So this is a fundamental principle of living systems. Before we get into our discussion then, what I'd like to do is have us all just settle in for a moment and think about our experiences in contact with nature, particularly in woodlands and forests. Think about the way that when you're in a place like that, you're inhaling all of this fresh oxygen that the plants are producing. And every breath you exhale, that carbon is mostly going to be captured by the plants around you. Trees are building that into their own bodies in a way that that carbon that you've metabolized will be part of their living structure for decades or centuries after you pass by. So I invite you to just settle in, and think about being in that forest and being bathed in that agaya and Ubuntu, that reciprocity, that wonder. And just see what comes up in your mind for that. And I'll give us about 90 seconds of silence to just settle in with that.
right? Um, so before we continue, I'd just like to go around the room and uh, learn at least a little bit about who's here. So uh, if everyone can just, um, I'll unmute you one at a time. And if you can just say who you are and where you're calling in from. Um, and maybe if you want to just give us one, one word about um, a tree or a plant or something that uh, came up for you during that meditation or something else that, that really moves and inspires you when you see it. So just, um, just that description or, you know, just a word or two of something in nature that really um, inspires you or that you really connect with. And I'll model that for you. So I'm Michelle. I'm calling from near Santa Cruz, California. And I love redwood trees. So how about, uh, let's see here. Uh, Kendon, why don't you go ahead and go? Unmuted. Thank you. Uh, Kendon Smith, Santa Cruz. Uh, I have the great good fortune when I turn my gaze toward the light of looking out at the ocean. Great. And it's become more and more part of me. Wonderful. And how about uh, Jamin? Can you tell us? Yes, yes. Hello, everyone. Great to be here. Um, I am co-founder and president of radish.org, radish like the vegetable .org, And what we are mainly focused on is the development and application of collective intelligence to this whole massive uh, predicament. I agree with everything you're doing here. And uh, that's what I'm working on. And uh, you know, in terms of areas of specific application, our two biggest are feeding everyone nutritious whole food plant-based diets and also cooling the planet through solar radiation management, massive scale, planetary scale SRM to cool the planet in time. Um, so that's me in a nutshell. Very happy to be here. Nice. A little bit distracted from time to time, but definitely here. So thank you all. Thank all right. you. Thanks, Jamie. And um, let's see, Dana, good to see you again. Hi, I remembered you were doing this, so I found it somehow. Um, I, uh, I'm in Henderson, Nevada. My name is Dana. I, I also love the redwood trees because I used to live right near you in the Santa Cruz area for 15 years. Mm -hmm. I lived right in the redwoods. Yeah, nice. Thanks, Dana. And, um, Let's see, is Sol Farsas on? So are you there? Um, I'm, <clears throat> I'm in London, UK. And um, when I was looking at the forest, I thought it would be quite nice to have a bowl of uh, leaves from the forest floor to smell because there's no smell and, and forests are noisy and there was no sand in the forest. Hmm. Thanks. All right. And um, let's see, is Donnie there? Donnie Kent? Hi, my name is Danny. Hi. And Danny. This is my first time at Unity Week, so I'm excited to meet everybody. And thanks for letting me hang out. Great. Thanks, Danny. And uh, Peter, are you there? Oh, maybe stepped away. Um, Lionel, do you want to check in? Yeah, hi there. I'm Lionel. Um, call it, joining uh, from Vermont. And um, this is uh, the first season that I've lived here in Vermont, and I'm in a rural place. So I've had a chance to see the forest right next to the house. Um, go through its changes this year um, as we went from winter 
and heavy snows into the snow melting and then the buds forming on the trees and then the leaves just bursting to life mm -hmm. and the sort of like amount of insects and trees and plants that bloom all at once and come to life in this area is um, really unlike anything I knew in California growing up there um, and it's, it's a majestic sort of experience actually to to, to witness it um, so I'm grateful to be here and be part of be part of the ecology of Vermont great thank you and um, oop, things are rearranging here um, let's see uh, go ahead Benny thank you hi everyone good to see y'all here um, I am in Santa Cruz as well um, and I'm definitely was thinking about the redwood forest um, during our little opening meditation, but um, there's something about oak trees that touches my heart. Um, I don't know the way they they move their limbs as they through their, their lifetime scale. It's a lot more, it just feels so much more dynamic. Um, and I love all the incredible um, fungi that they're host to. Mm. And so I see a lot of wisdom in oak trees just as much as I feel it in redwoods. Thank you. And a um, couple of people joined after we were starting these intros. I think uh, it says Jacques, Jacques? Follow on? Jackie. Jackie. Welcome. So we're just saying who we are, uh, where we're calling from, and um, something in nature that inspires us. Hello. Uh, so my name is Jackie Solomon, calling from Phoenix, Arizona. Um, and what inspires me in nature is regeneration, self healing. Beautiful. Thank you. And James, James Desmond. Hi, how are you? Um, my name is James Desmond. I'm from uh, Cork City in Ireland. And um, I'm uh, uh, along with the group with Jackie and Jim and, and the rest of the group. Um, for me, nature, nature is rebirth, I suppose, and, and, and life going on and, and all that entails for all life. So, um, that's the beauty of nature for me and, and, and the joy to see that continue is, is my passion. So that's why I'm here because I fear for that now. So thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, James. And uh, Paul, I don't think I've had, had you come in yet. Hey there. Um, so I am also in Santa Cruz. Um, I've uh, delighted in hearing the number of people who thought of redwoods. Um, I think I felt truly at home in the world for the first time when I stepped into an old growth redwood forest um, up north on the coast of California. Um, here in Santa Cruz, we are doubly um, fortunate because we're between the ocean in the forest. So both worlds are open to us here. I'm delighted to see you all. Wonderful. Thank you. And is there anyone in the room that I missed? Okay. Um, so as I said, my intention now is I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the, the origins of this forest bathing Shinrin-yoku as a practice, a little bit about the science behind it, how it works. Um, and then uh, Paul will go a little bit deeper into what the experience is like. And uh, Kendon will talk about uh, body mind and how the for time in the forest is um, healing for helping us connect 
the different parts of our, our intelligences. So um, this practice from Japan of Shinrin-yoku has been around for a very long time. And the phrase Shinrin-yoku is usually translated in English as forest bathing. A little bit closer from Japanese, as I understand it, would be uh, forest showering, that it's raining down on you. And it's about being immersed in the sensory experience of time in the forest. So a Shinrin Yoku practice can be very short, 15 minutes, you go out, you spend some time in the trees, um, or it could be a 10 day retreat, months if you wanted. Um, most of what you see practitioners doing during Shinrin Yoku is walking very slowly sometimes just standing or sitting. This is not a athletic hike into the woods. When you're practicing Shinrin Yoku, there's a very strong emphasis to not exert effort. That it should be easy and comfortable and as slow as you can comfortably make it. And the reason for that is you're trying to open your senses as wide as possible and take in as much as you can of what is going on around you. You want to really savor that experience. So if you can imagine going out into the forest trying to open your senses as wide as you can, really deeply and fully experiencing it. How does the breeze feel? How does it sound moving through the leaves? Are you hearing any birds or insects? How does each tree or each shrub smell? What other scents are coming to you from the soil? What are the different colors and textures of the light coming through the trees? How does the ground under your feet feel? And then you want to really attend to what's calling to you in the forest. What catches the attention of your senses? Follow that fascination. Go with it. Learn about it. You spot an ant walking across the path. Watch it walk all the way across. See what it's up to. Does it encounter any of its sisters? What is it carrying? Where is it going? In my personal Shinrin Yoku practice, I spend a lot of time really trying to empathize with the organisms that I encounter to try to imagine what their sensory experience is. So this practice is a kind of a walking meditation, a little bit more active than that. Um, you're generally not going to be interacting with other people during the walk but a lot of people will do it in community by meeting together beforehand, talking about their plan, and then coming back together afterward. And in particular, um, for people who know the plants in the area, someone might collect some things that can be then brewed into a tea so that you get a taste experience of the forest as well. Um, this was considered so healing for people that in 1982, the National Health Program of Japan decided that doctors can prescribe it. You know, they actually literally write out a prescription. You must go spend some time in the woods. There are now programs 
uh, of various kinds all over the world to encourage and support people in learning the practice of forest bathing. And there's an incredible amount of research that supports um, how profound the health benefits are. And I wanna uh, share a slide with you to just show you a little bit of that. Okay, um, so as you can imagine, spending time in the forest, it lowers your blood pressure, you feel better. Surprisingly, it actually has all kinds of improvements for metabolic function, things like blood glucose levels, for immune function. It's been shown to slow cancer growth. These are serious scientific studies. Um, it has dramatic effects on your nervous system activity. It really balances it out, lowers your stress hormones. Um, people do report on psychological tests that they have much lower symptoms with things that you wouldn't want, like anxiety, depression, confusion, and um, much higher scores on feeling invigorated feeling comfortable, relaxed. Uh, people even improve their own body image, not because they're getting more fit, but something about time in the forest helps you connect with your own body better. Um, as I said, these are, there are just dozens upon dozens of studies related to this. Um, Japan has had a, a very vigorous program of research uh, since the 80s. Um, I've got a lot of those references on the Nova Sutras website and I'll paste that link in chat in, in a couple of minutes here. Um, so the amazing thing is with all of this, with all of this stuff, how does this work? What is the magic here? Um, when they try to look into what are the what are the activities, what are the um, things that make this happen? Some of it seems to be, have to do with scent. So um, as, uh, oh, I forget who it was that mentioned having a, having a bowl of leaves with you because of that scent. Yeah, just the scent alone contributes to some of these positive effects. Um, some of the chemicals that you inhale, that's when you're smelling something, you're actually taking in chemicals. Uh, are these alpha pinene chemicals, especially in the, uh, the conifers, the pine trees, um, that seem to do really wonderful things for you. Of course, you're getting this incredible sensory variety, all of these different sounds, all of these different um, experiences of, of air movement and temperature change and lighting change. And it's almost exactly the opposite of what we do with our indoor spaces. Our indoor spaces, we try to minimize how much sensory fluctuation there is, right? Constant lighting, constant temperature. Well, that's not actually the situation that we as humans evolved in. Um, we evolved in the forests. Just before the dinosaurs went extinct, the earliest primates appeared. And primates evolved in forests for over 60 million years. Our ancestors were forest beings. All of our senses are attuned to life in the forest. The shape of our hands and, and their ability to grasp, this is for grabbing hold of a branch and supporting your weight with it. That's how we got opposable thumbs in the first place. We are forest creatures. You know, last five million years, slightly less so, but 60 million years of time in the forest, that's deep. So as I mentioned, 
the power of these practices of getting back in touch with being in the forest, this gives us strength to do any of the difficult work that we have to do in the world. Whether it's the work of, um, as some people were saying in the chat, you know, what's going on with Black Lives Matter right now and the amazing and deeply challenging work that has to be done around social justice in the United States and honestly all around the world. That's going to take strength. How can we make sure that all of the people who are engaged with that have the strength that they need? And I sincerely believe that supporting opportunities to connect with nature is one of the best offerings that we can provide for that. So, um, that was most of what I wanted to tell you about. Um, I'm happy to pause now and see if there are any questions or comments or input that people have. Uh, and you can just wave at the camera or use the um, use the hands up thing in the in zoom and let us know if you want to talk um, or just go ahead and we're small enough just go ahead and unmute yourself uh, if you have a, a question um, hi okay, Michelle um, have you got some kind of dwelling in a forest where you can take people you know somewhere where they can have walks in the forest and then go and have a cup of tea and hang, hang, hang around in the hut. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I wish that I did. I, I have friends who do. Um, uh, we actually have a really beautiful um, state park uh, near where I live, where the local community here in Santa Cruz has gathered several times to do, to do this together. And then um, yeah, I just, I just bring some forest tea from things that I've collected uh, on the trails that are near where I live um, so that we get a little forest tea as well. But yeah, there are definitely people, um, again, there are people who offer programs all around the world and a lot of them have residential programs for a long-term forest immersion session um, or, you know, afternoon programs. Um, weekend programs that are available uh, so you know look for forest bathing forest immersion in your area and you might find that um i actually i actually got in touch with um a woman she was part part of a network of people that i knew and uh, she had a cabin uh, mm -hmm. it's right next to the wood uh, the door in the garden, it's a very big garden, it goes out straight into the woods. So the trees overhanging the uh, cabin are the wood. And so um, she used to let me use it. I've been there about two times, I think. And I felt, you know, like I wanted to do something in return. So she wasn't very good at cleaning. So I spring cleaned her kitchen for her. And by the time I'd got to the next um, visit, she it was dirty again. So that worked out quite nicely. It was lovely, so lovely. Oh, great. Yeah, I actually, I'm uh, remembering that I had wanted to, to read another quote for you. This is um, from Linda Lombardo, who's another uh, um, person who leads people on um, forest immersion type experiences. And she says, it's more than just a walk in nature. It's a sacred activism to rebuild a regenerative culture the kind of culture indigenous people knew, the kind of culture that perhaps our own ancestors knew. When nature becomes personal again, we will begin to heal ourselves and our relationship with nature. Then our real work can begin. Is there anyone else who's, um, who's tried or, or had some experiences similar to this? And I know Paul's going to uh, going to take us a little deeper into what this is 
what this is like and what this is about. Any other comments or questions? Or Paul, are you ready to step in now? Great. Hey there. So I got um, introduced to forest immersion by the forest itself um, when I walked into an old growth redwood forest on the north coast of California. Uh, I had never been in any redwood forest. Uh, I grew up with a father who uh, had a bad limp, so we couldn't go camping. But when I stepped into that forest, um, it was immediately uh, a transforming experience. Um, there was a sense of being, uh, I had just, I could not recall ever being happier to be anywhere. And it was a particular kind of happiness um, that I think we often find elusive, where all of you is happy at once, where you're present completely in that experience of being glad, of being alive, right where and when you are. Um, so there's a sense in which I feel like um, that, that experience is sort of how we're supposed to be and, and that it is calling to us or being offered to us uh, at all times uh, by the earth on which we live. Uh, that is where I happened to find it. So I'm going to try to share my screen. It's just the darndest thing. Um, okay, so I'll just keep talking for a moment. One of the things that happened to me is I, I had gone up north to go to college. Um, college very quickly became an afterthought. Um, the mode of learning on offer in college classrooms seems so slow and uh, sort of belabored compared to what I was experiencing uh, hiking every day in the redwoods. I think of the time we live in of multiple ecological crises and I think of how um, it's terrifying and it, it, is, it is full of grief. It is also, it seems to me, a time of extraordinarily rapid learning where we're getting constantly just this immense amount of information back uh, in response to activity that often very little thought uh, went into. But we're getting, you know, sort of just uh, really a ton of urgent information about what does and doesn't uh, serve life on earth uh, and what we uh, need to do if we want to sustain life on earth. Um, and, and so I was reflecting just before this session that my experience in the woods, um, I think it's the first time in my life I felt like I was learning just by breathing. You know, it was like, um, it was like I was blank or, or, or like a dry sponge. Um, and all of a sudden, there was moisture all around me and I was just taking it in or like a book where all the pages were blank. And then I would spend hours in the woods 
And they were wonderful while I was there, but it didn't end there. When I went away and spent time reflecting, uh, you know, it was as if I had received in a few hours uh, more of an education uh, than I than I had in you know certainly a year of public school. Um, so the sense of being uh, able to take in a great deal of information at once, um, not like you do with sort of, you know, through the internet or, or, or the mass media where we all talk about information overload, but where taking in a great deal of information at once, absorbing it through your skin, uh, feeling it almost at the cellular, cellular level, trusting this process of learning, even though you can tell that it is absolutely changing you, uh, trusting it enough to let it speak to you uh, really all the way to your innermost self. Uh, that seems to me to be the kind of learning that we need now. And I think the place where we can experience that as joyous and life affirming, the place where it can be an education in harmony and connection and relatedness, not as something one has to puzzle out uh, or invent, but as a simple, a natural, desirable, and pervasive defining quality uh, of existence here on Earth. Forests are amazingly rich ecosystems, and they present us with not just harmony and balance, but an enormous variety that saying that you can never uh, set foot in the same river twice. Uh, my experience in the forest is that that's, that is true in this very different and arresting way, that um, it is literally, it's just never the same place. And if you find a forest that's a little bigger than the, I'm thinking right now of the, um, Redwood Grove Henry Cowell State Park. We've done some local forest immersions there. I, I love that place. Um, but if you, if you can find your way into a slightly larger uh, stretch of forest, um, what I find is that you, you keep encountering things that you know you've walked there before. You, you, you had to have seen it. And yet it is just arrestingly new. Um, so when you do this a lot, when you spend time in the woods a lot, uh, if you're like me, you will begin to experience a sense of being um, at home that is different than feeling at home because you're with a family that loves you or feeling at home because you're in a place where people know you or feeling at home because you're in a city where you know the layout of the city and you know how to get around. It's a different kind of being at home. It is a kind of being at home where a question that I think is almost never absent when we are uh, in the human world and in society about whether we are welcome, about whether it's really okay to be who we are 
where we are, that question has vanished and in its place is a sense, for me at least, that in some way, the sort of complete person I was when I was a baby or a toddler, the person uh, who was unfiltered, uncensored, and fully present um, and whole had not yet uh, not yet become fractured. The, I am called back to that person. I am called back to that experience of being alive. So when we say, and I think this is a common way of, of guiding people into forest immersion to sort of open your senses. Um, it's also helpful just to think that, you know, my experience is my senses open by themselves. They open because they are surrounded by beauty. They open because there is no assault on them, which uh, unfortunately we, <laughs> we have made a world where the senses are often um, shrinking back from things that are too bright or too loud or too busy. Um, so my experience that, that day I walked into that old growth redwood forest, everything we do in forest immersion, I did naturally. My senses did not just open. There is something, it's a little bit like surfing. There's something that happens to my awareness and I realize this whole little talk of mine may just convince you that I'm a little odd, uh, but, but, but my experience is very much like what Michelle suggested that your, the forest is, is constantly sort of inviting our awareness that, that, that if you let it, you will find your attention sort of guided through what surrounds you. And if you let it, you will find your, your pace slowing down uh, just sort of naturally and automatically and the quality of your step will change. When I first stepped into that forest, I thought I was clumsy. I had uh, shot up about a foot and a half in two years um, when I was a kid. So uh, I had been sort of spectacularly uncoordinated and I was also very, um, unsure of myself in sports. So I, I walked into the forest, not, you know, really doubting that I was ever going to be at ease in my body or to feel that my movements through the world were easy and graceful. So one of the things that happened hiking every day is that I found my footing, literally. Um, I, and the quality of my, I began to step more lightly. I was more sure-footed. I did not have to look all the time uh, where I was going. Um, and I, I very rarely tripped, even though the forest I was in was not like the one where we do our forest immersions. Uh, the trail was very narrow and sometimes disappeared altogether. And, uh, lots of lots of opportunities uh, to stumble or feel less than graceful. Um, we need so much. We just need so very very much to be free in a very particular sense, and this is the heart and soul of what I have to say. 
it can be hard when you're getting so much feedback from the world. You have these multiple ecological crises and, and it seems very clear that it isn't just one or two things that are wrong with the way our, with our way of, of uh, living in the world that, um, well, we certainly do need to stop burning fossil fuels immediately, um, that, it, that it's more than that. It can be hard to feel hopeful because it can seem as if as ill-adapted as our ways of doing things are, they're just very rigid and fixed and, you know, uh, they're getting worse all the time, but they've been this way forever. And there's all these sort of mental, uh, I don't know, all these ways in which it is easy to feel like, well, this may be doomed, but what would we do otherwise because this is what we know um, and where would our guidance come from if we were going to try to live differently if we were going to try to establish our life together on sure ground what ground would that be there is a fear of being lost i think is what i'm saying i think that climate denial in some ways is very much a part of this it's not just that it's scary and we don't want to accept it. It's that it's telling us that fundamentally our orientation to life in the world is off, that we would have to find another one and we're not sure that we can do that. So what I notice every single time I spend time in the woods is that when I come back, and all the same challenges are there. My society has not conveniently uh, reformed itself while I was in the woods. I wish that would happen. But I apologize. But when I have had a few hours in the woods, what had seemed intractable no longer does. And that whole sort of structure of maladaptive relationships that need to be changed uh, no longer seem to me They no longer are, are as uh, the sense of them as permanent or existing independently of us, of there being a world that, that happens to us and is imposed on us, uh, that really has greatly diminished. And I am able to think about how we go about change a little bit more like a Zen archer, finding the shortest distance between two points. So Michelle said, we spent human beings this enormous amount of time in the forest. The forest is where we begin. Shinrin Yoku for me, and this is um, very much my own take on it. It is going back to life in the beginning or going back to being in the beginning of life. So the experience of going into the forest, which is a world we did not make. Right? That experience, interestingly enough, at the end of it, I feel so much more in tune or in touch with the part of me that is a creator. So much more aware of 
what's the stuff we made versus what's the stuff that's real independently of us. And I think that is a little bit like going sane. And maybe, um, maybe the best benefit of Shinrin Yoku of all. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Paul. Um, and I want to open it up to questions again. Um, and I realized before I do, I'd, I'd forgotten that I was going to introduce these two brilliant people. Um, so let me just give you a quick introduction to Paul, and then I'll introduce Kendon uh, before he comes in to speak. But um, Paul is uh, one of the most amazing activists I know. He's He worked for over a decade on um, rural poverty and hunger issues. He's currently engaged with climate activists in Africa in putting a, a, a short film together about climate consequences in Africa and just um, how, you know, we, we in, the, in the North are privileged enough to be able to say, oh, climate change is coming. No, climate change is present and people are truly suffering. Um, and being able to elevate the voices of African climate activists and to show what's really going on there. And he is such a champion of that. Um, it just, it's amazing stuff that he's, he's up to. So I wanted you to, to fully appreciate just how wonderful he is. And then I'm gonna, tell you, Kendon, there is so much to fully appreciate just how wonderful he is, but we'll get to that in a moment. Um, and uh, right now I wanted to open it up if people have uh, questions, comments, things they want to say for Paul. Um, Jamin, it looks like you've got your hand up. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, so great to be here. I just really want to thank, uh, thank you, Paul, for everything that you've shared. I mean, it's like, these are things that like I know, but I've never heard articulated, right? And um, I think that's just so important for our species because so much of what we take in is through our ears. And so I just really wanna commend you and thank you and say rock on brother. You know, here I am, someone who's just hearing you for the first time. And um, I just want everyone to hear your message because it just, it's just taken me back in time to all, I grew up in Northern California, the East Bay of the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, so I know Santa Cruz very well and you're very blessed where you are. And um, yeah, I've had just amazing experiences in the Redwoods. And thankfully we have the, you know, Berkeley and Oakland Hills just right there with this vast East Bay Regional Park system. So um, anyway, I just wanna thank you. I mean, it's just like you're awakening stuff that I just, it's like my body and myself, my soul knew, but I never heard it articulated. And that's so important for us human beings to hear stuff articulated. So um, thank you. I just love everything you all are doing. I'm just so glad I'm here. And I just wanna, you know, welcome Emery, who just joined from Montreal, Canada. Emery and James and So and Jackie and Melvin and I had a bunch of us. We congregate on radish meetings uh, two days a week. Tuesdays and Fridays are our big days. And uh, in fact, we're on a field trip from our normal Tuesday meeting to be here with you all. So <laughs> anyway, radish.org is where we where we live and you're all welcome all the time, always. In fact, love to have you, love to schedule you in to give talks on Radish uh, and but just, wow, thank you. I'm complete going on mute, thank you. Oh, thanks so much for that, gentlemen. And um, you, might, you might have caught it just in the way he speaks, but I forgot to mention that Paul is also a poet of um, quite a lot of talent. Um, so that's that's part of what we got. And yeah, just like you with, with Radish, um, Nova Sutras, we have these ongoing long form conversations. It's a big piece of what we do as well. Um, so there are definitely things that we need to hook up about um, and, and uh, 
yeah, amplify what we're, uh, what we're up to. Amplifying positive deviance, that's how natural selection works. So uh, <laughs> we're on to something. Um, other questions, comments? Things coming up for people? Hi, um, I, I would just like to thank Paul as well there for that, for that, for sharing there as well. And it was, you know, it, it was something I didn't think about until you started talking there, Paul, about your experience and about the experience that you feel in the woods. And it made me start to think a bit about it. And as, I from, as I'm from Ireland myself, um, we don't have the, the luxury of having the, the, the red giant redwoods here in Ireland, as you know yourselves, if you're, you know, indigenous to yourselves. And but I did get a chance, I was lucky enough to, um, to travel through uh, Seattle, Washington, Oregon, uh, into Idaho, and it got as far as Montana. They were back in about 2012. Um, I was kind of doing a bit of a, it was my first abroad holiday, but I was doing a learning holiday as well. I was following the Lewis and Clark's trail from the Pacific as far back in towards the mountains as I could. But um, when I was in uh, Lewiston in uh, Oregon, I stayed in the Lewis and Clark National Park in the camping park for a, a, for a few days. I was camping there and I met a lovely middle-aged couple. They were named uh, Rob and Sue Lundgren. And uh, Rob, Sue was a librarian up in Idaho in a, a small town called Kooski, Idaho. And uh, Rob was a, um, a forestry, um, a member of the forestry and he used to a forest fighter and everything else. And uh, he's retired now, they're both retired. Um, but they, they were they were a very kind couple and they, they brought me right up as far as Kooski, Idaho and Rob was very uh, generous enough to offer to come back one day and take me further up into the into the Lolo Pass to the museum, to the Nez Perce Museum. I was very interested in going there and on the way up he brought me and stopped me off on um, a red uh, cedarwood forest and um, he introduced me to the redwood there and he brought me to, um, um, there was a forestry museum as well on the way up as well. But uh, he showed me in the, in the Redwood, he was telling me that they explained how, they, how old the trees were and how, how long they lived. And we were looking at a plaque by, um, it was uh, Bernard, Bernard Devoto. He was a conservationist. There was a plaque there in the forest to him. He was a conservationist and historian. Uh, um, around 1890s to late, the end of the 1800s, and he was born. But um, there was a plaque there commemorated him, and Rob was telling me how old the trees were and how long they lived. So as Rob took a photograph of me, I, I could see his modern kind of uh, four by four parked on the road behind us, and I knew where I was, I was aware of my surroundings, and I was very much caught up in the moment of being in America at the time and, and you know, enjoying all the experience. But as he took the photograph and then I turned around and closed my eyes and went in again, I felt that I was transported in time because it was, it felt just if, when I opened my eyes again and thought about how old the trees were, I was no longer in modern day America when I opened my eyes, I was back in the time of the Lewis and Clark Trail and when the time of the indigenous people walked and bred the same air that I was breathing, I got that experience and that feeling automatically it was transported in time and I hadn't thought about it until you just started speaking there so thank you very much for that like it was a pleasurable memory to come back for me like, and I appreciate that. Thank you. And uh, Kendon you wanted to add something here? I raised my hash um, so a part of our title is Awakening Body, the derivation of the word indigenous was part of awakening of body mind and I wonder if you could say a couple of sentences about that. You're, you're on mute if you would. Yes. Um, Thank you. So let me see if I actually can share that slide because it is a, a helpful thing. Um, just a second. We'll do it next time for 
No, I think I got it. Um, I have the oddest little foible with uh, screen sharing and Zoom, but I think I got it. If not, I will just talk us through it. There it is. Uh, so, I love the etymology of the word indigenous. Um, this uh, arrangement of it um, shows us that the deep root uh, is from Proto-Indo-European. It's the word gene, which means give birth, beget. Uh, you add to that from Old Latin, Hindu, which means in, within. Uh, Jignere, I think, um, to beget, produce. And that leads us to indigena, sprung from the land, native, a native, inborn, born in. When I first saw that etymology, um, it did immediately remind me of my experience in that uh, old growth redwood forest, the year I spent hiking there and how profoundly changed I was by it. Uh, it truly did uh, change the whole course of my life. Um, and so I had thought um, in, in preparing for this talk that I might sort of invoke the language of rebirth. Uh, certainly one way of looking at the, the challenges we face um, is that we are kind of all called to be reborn as earthlings. I think, too, of how, you know, when you think of indigenous people like the Aboriginal people of Australia who were quite confident were in place for 60,000 years um, without uh, doing a great deal of violence to the web of life surrounding them, but um, becoming intimately familiar with it. Um, and when you think of, of any indigenous people, um, it seems very clear that it is not just that these are people who know how to obtain everything they need from the world surrounding them, the natural world as we call it, surrounding them, um, without depleting or exhausting or destroying it. But it seems very clear that they are not just meeting material needs or biological needs, that that world is sustaining them and nourishing them and inspiring them and filling their entire being. Uh, and that, of course, as you, as you will know from my talk, um, is an experience I think that is right there for us. Uh, in the forest, uh, on the beach, anywhere at all in nature, even in the gardens we create uh, in cities. I'm very excited about uh, kind of rewilding cities or about bringing, bringing uh, the forest into the city, I think is a, a very exciting prospect. Uh, but anyhow, um, always a lot to learn from words. Uh, 
Um, and I think that's good. Thanks, Paul. So I'd like us to, um, to move on now to hear uh, Kendon's piece of this. Um, Kendon is, oh, how to summarize this quickly. Kendon has <laughs> decades of experience um, working in mental health, uh, working as a child psychotherapist, uh, a psychopharmacologist, and his recent work has been on uh, meditation and focusing and what is happening with the, um, the brain-mind system uh, in these practices that seem to bring us into ourselves in a different way. Um, so I am just so privileged to be able to call Kendon um, a dear friend and um, I'm really looking forward to uh, how he's weaving these together. So Kendon, please. Take Thank you, in. Michelle. And my screen claims that you have uh, muted my video and that you have to unmute my video for my picture. I will so, fix that then. There we go. You might have to click one more thing to actually come back on. Very good, thank you. All right. So I hang out locally with global activists of whom the Nova Sutras crowd is one. We overlap here, we overlap there. And my shtick, my message recurrently might be summarized as as without so within and so when michelle earlier on identifies me as an atheist um, one of the things i'm tracking personally with a neuroscience background is how does all work among our emotional responses among our capacities for experiencing the world. And that's what focus on in relation to Shinrin Yoku. Uh, and we're talking about the forest, but I have been to Grand Canyon, I've been to Bryce Canyon, uh, uh, Glacier National Park. Uh, and within me, what is evoked by those experiences um, has a lot of uh, consistency. I can call it awe for the moment. It's a word. Um, and so how does that come about? Well, I would offer that when we are present to something of somehow such scope that manifests so powerfully in existence. Our attention is caught, our attention is riveted, our mind is quieted. We don't think, we experience for the moment. And then everyone has their own particular, I mean, dance, music, has their own sort of primary or central path in that kind of experiencing of existence. Um, so this particular session is taking off from the forest experience. But we entitle ourselves awakening body-mind, we entitle ourselves empowering earthlings and Michelle, I would ask of you, if you could, to put up on the screen the Nova Sutra rules for dialogue. And the point I want to make in looking at this is 
the way we come together in Nova Sutras, and you will all have your local versions of this, honors our humanness, honors what in us feels part of things. And when we aren't caught up in the clutter of thought, um, and we're in a situation that permits us to pause and be an experienced being, um, the quality of the experience we have is different. So this is one of the things in addition to Agaya and Ubuntu that Michelle put up earlier, our discussion agreements is one of the things we put up uh, each time we come together. And we typically review each of these briefly that we will listen deeply and respectfully. We will honor all points of view. Uh, we will give our full attention. We will assume best intentions. We, we, we will share honestly and authentically, and I would emphasize authentically and that how we participate, the more fully we participate. Um, you experience me, if I'm just sitting listening, as being there and being a, connected to what you're saying, and that is somehow we are each being authentic and then keeping stories and specific confidential and leaving silence after someone speaks. Uh, but and thanks, Michelle. Um, in a way, we're bringing the forest to our discussion groups. And we're being, when we come together this way, we are honoring one another as we might honor a redwood. I cry easily, tears, you know, begin to surface. Uh, but coming back to um, what's going on as without, so within. Um, what I'm writing about these days is body-mind. Um, in jargon, the way I say that is an implicit self in a primal cortex. But there's an earlier form of cortex paleo mammalian, allocortical, whatever, um, that has a simpler organization. And it can only experience holistically, it can only manifest by being embodied. Uh, but is the um, gateway to the rest of us. Um, and body mind is one legitimate way of talking about how that simpler system operates and to the extent, extent that engages in what we're doing to that extent it has greater meaning uh, we are we feel ourselves to be a part of it and so another thing our crowd does beginning of each of our we have two meetings a week on discussion and difficult times and one or more i don't remember how many on grief because uh one thank you michelle um because to care is to be at risk of loss and our culture is not the greatest at honoring grief and the processing of it each of our meetings will begin with typically derek another one of the group will say to each of us um, where is your heart of mind at the moment? And the emphasis on the heart. And you stand back and you take yourself in and you find what matters to you in this moment. And then you share that. So right now, what matters to me is more or less, I want you to hear my message. I want you to give the time you deserve in your experiencing of life around you, the forest, the Zoom meeting. Um, and then we'll do that. We may do it. It depends. I mean, if someone's got an issue, it may take a little longer. But 
having entered into the discussion that way, with my heartfelt uh, concern, I experience each of your concerns differently. So these are ways in which Nova Sutras is doing the job that maybe the religions have done for us historically, more or less. Uh, it's trying to provide our humanness with the fertilization and the water and the sunlight uh, that enable us to grow. Now I'll pause for a moment and see, because what I've said today is very different from what I intended to say, but I'm satisfied with it. Um, so the question, here we are with, I can't even recapture the title, World Unity Week. Um, and I'll put in a plug for Body Mind here. To the extent you get better at listening to yourself, and that takes silence, takes a pause, different form of knowing from conscious thought. Doesn't have access to conscious thought, doesn't have a past, doesn't have a future, doesn't have memory, it just exists and makes choices moment by moment. And it's enabled us to survive for 60 million years. Neocortex has slowly been coming online, but And here it's an assertion, we benefit from practicing the listening. And there are alternatives. Meditation is a hugely significant parallel approach. Um, and the state you enter into when you bathe in the forest is, it puts you in a frame of mind where you can hear what matters to you more easily. You don't have the distraction, the confusion of all the stimuli that are going on. And yeah, we got to respond to the stimuli and <laughs> the nonsense and the craziness and the wrongness. Um, but are we giving ourselves time? And so I'll sort of stop here and ask if people might perhaps say a bit about what they do for themselves in parallel to the possibility of, say, forest bathing uh, for renewal in grappling with the really hugely confounding reality um, that the world has become. Thank you. Well, I can step in with a little response to that. So yeah, I, I do, um, although the last week and a half has been a bit of an exception, um, try to try to practice some kind of forest immersion um, at least five or six days a week. Um, but as part of that practice, in addition to being in that Shinrin Yoku space, I also do a small ritual. Um, uh, those of you familiar with Nova Sutras may know our calling the corners practice. And um, that sort of ritual, sort of prayer in that space helps me reset it as um, getting in touch with those deeper piece, parts of my being. Um, but that's, it reminds me that that's where I am now and that's what I'm doing next. Um, so I find that that ritual practice is very helpful. Um, you know, uh, you're talking oh. about being in forests in a very idealistic way. And I've been in forests in that way. But there's always a scary thing about the forest. And I think you know, if I was in America, I'd be really scared a bear was <laughs> going to jump on me. <laughs> and I'd also, as a woman, um, I'm sort of I'm not as attractive as I used to be, but I still think some man is going to leap out on me. You know, there's that side of it as well. Yeah. Um, 
Thank you. That's a that's a point well taken. And it is. I've I've worked in um, rainforests with tigers and cobras, and you know uh, there there were real uh, potential lethal threats in addition to other humans. Um, Partly the, the practices locally, you know, there aren't very many bears in this county. Um, there are some mountain lions. They tend to be very afraid of humans. Um, so it's a little easier because of that. Partly I think there's, and I think Kenyon was kind of getting at this, there's this bodily wisdom that if you can settle into it, is ready to deal with that. Again, we have you know, all of our evolution as animals essentially constantly evolved in the presence of threats like predators. And um, that, that wide open senses is keeping you calmly ready to respond. Um, and it's, it's getting into the habit of quieting your, your conscious mind, your chattering mind that reminds you that all of those threats are there and paying attention to all of that sensory information that is telling you actually right now there isn't a threat. Just keep your eyes open, just be alert, um, and then be ready to respond. And, um, I, so I want to make sure that, that you're finished, but then I know uh, Jamin's had his hand up for a while, so I want to pass over to him. Was, was there, is there more you needed to say on that? Um, just that things can hide behind trees and it's, it, you know, there are open forests. When I stayed in the cabin that I told you about, um, quite a few people said to me, wasn't I scared? Because it was at the end of a very, very long garden. So, and I was right, apart from the gate, I was in the forest. And it, you know, I was quite isolated there. And I hadn't really thought too much. We haven't got bears here in England. And I hadn't thought too much about the danger. And um, then it was put to me and then I did think about it and you know people can hide behind trees in forests and it's quite hard to run away and you know it did it was there you know in the background of my mind once it's been put to me thanks for presencing that okay gentlemen go ahead oh, sorry there you go Oh, thank there? you, thank you. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm good. Um, well, and, and by the way, I want to commend you for your just outstanding moderation and holding this space uh, for all of us. And since I I moderate um, over th literally over thirty hours per week of Zoom video conference meetings, um, because I am. Uh, uh, yeah, and it, it's it's it it really it takes a lot of of energy, um, and I do it. I mean, th the biggest of those chunks is is a twenty four hour collective intelligence block party that we hold on Zoom every Friday Saturday. We start at six a.m. Pacific time Friday morning, and we go a full twenty four hours till six a.m. Saturday morning. And uh, I take a break in the middle of the night for a few hours and take a long nap and uh, a colleague takes over during that time. But anyway, um, we, and the other one is our Tuesday Solution Club at the beginning of the new world, which we we're on a field trip from right now. So I'm kind of, I get to have like a break. I don't have to moderate. I can be a kid again kind of thing. <laughs> anyway, just kidding. Um, no, not, not, not just kidding. And, I, and Dr. Kendon, I really love what you said about us kind of bringing the forest together here in conversation. Um, because this is, you know, you know we're, we're part forest, but we're also part, you know, huddle. 
you know, of, of humans coming together around the fire, in a sense, you know, tuning out the rest of nature to focus in on our, on our humanity, on our tribe, on the conversation. And um, this meeting here and your community, number one, I am in love with you all. I mean, I just literally have this, this feeling of love throughout my, my body. Um, and I take that very seriously. Uh, this is my heart saying, I love this, all right? This is good stuff. And um, I can see that you have a beautifully cultivated, holistically nurtured, compassionate, loving, uh, beautifully sense-making community here that you have all cultivated. I really wanna commend you for that and I wanna be a part of it. And in fact, um, we have you know, been on our own track um, you know, admittedly much less forest centric and more kind of science centric in many ways, but not entirely, you know, we're, we're, we're definitely w deep into the holistic. All, all I'm saying is I hadn't, you know, gotten this foresty, you know, mentally uh, before, and I just love it. Um, and um, I, I just love the long form that you have here. You know, this is not uh, the O'Reilly factor on Fox News. This is <laughs> very much the opposite end of the spectrum, right? No one is told to shut up. People can really express themselves. And there's deep listening. I and mean, it's just like, wow. I mean, th this is a level of conversation that I would say that we aspire to uh, within Radish. And um, I, I get a sense, uh, Michelle, that you are just dynamite at, at this and that uh, this is not the first time that you have. Uh, this ain't your first rodeo, shall we say. Um, <laughs> and um, anyway, uh, I could go on and on, but what I, what I, where, where I really wanna get to is I am optimistic uh, for the first time in a big way. My heart is optimistic connecting with you all um, because I see just incredible opportunity for us to essentially merge two communities that have, um, you know, re really, thank you, thank you, Dr. Kendon, uh, that have, you know, really, we're essentially, um, we were essentially separated at birth, and now we've, you know, found each other on a beautiful hike in the Redwoods, and it's just like, whoa, that actually happened to me once on a hike in the uh, Redwood Regional Park in the East Bay, like, these two dogs that were part of the same litter, you know, like with their respective humans found each other on this trail and like it was just like literally since they had been newborn puppies that they, they they were reunited it was just wow it was so cool to see that that's what i feel like is happening here we were separated at birth and through no fault of our own you know we you know formed these two different communities and what I really see happening here, and this gets to the heart of what Radish was, was founded for, and of course it's evolving in, in cool directions, but um, what we were founded for was to create, was to help facilitate the birthing of collective superintelligence, which is but one, you know, uh, kaleidoscopic lens through at which one can look at this hyper object, which, Yes, it's about intelligence, but it's also about heart. It's about community. It's about deep radical spiritual transformation. It's about Mother Earth. It's about the holistic. I mean, I could go on and on, and, you know, interview each of the seven blind men in the proverbial story about the elephant. Uh, and each one is absolutely certain that they're right and all that. Anyway, um, we largely but not entirely focus on the collective superintelligence blind man's perspective on the elephant. Um, and... Uh, um, and I could go on and on. I'm, I'm, I'm ex Microsoft. I, you know, most of my career was in, was in tech. Um, and, uh, so, you know, I think a lot about the informational aspects of all this, which are profound and our ability to connect and form a network. But what I've been dreaming of is actually happening right here, right now. Right. Um, I sure hope I'm not dreaming now. Good. Okay. So, uh, is, as these as these communities start to connect, right? Um, this is the beginning of the Cambrian explosion, where a community is like a cell, right? So you've got your you know no, Nova Sutris, I hope I'm saying that right. Cell, you got your radish cell, and you know we were doing 
quite well, each of us for billions of years, thank you very much. But then when we found that we could connect and go multicellular, oh my goodness, all life broke loose, right? Beyond, you know, the unicell. And I feel like that's what's happening here. And I think we can actually show a really beautiful example to the rest of humanity um, of how we do this, right? Here's how you do the Cambrian explosion, bringing these benevolent cells together. Um, anyway, I've spoken for quite a bit. I don't like to dominate the mic um, and uh, just love you all. Go for it. I'm, I'm complete for the moment. I'm sure I'll have more to say. Go for it. Dr. Kendon has his hand raised. Michelle's moderating. Go for it. Okay. Yeah, actually, there were a couple of hands up before. Um, James, you had your hand up for a little bit. Did, did you have something you wanted to drop in? And then So had something to say. And then Kendon. Uh, thank you. Um, well, just in response to uh, Kendon, that I was, um, I, at the moment, unfortunately, I don't get a chance to immerse, immerse myself in forests uh, as much as I should. I suppose, because it's not within my reach, or it's not, that it's not within my reach, I should say. But um, at the moment, anyway, I don't let's just say that, but, um, you know, um, for for my my part, for it, my my way, I suppose, of trying to, you know, uh, make up for that every day, I, I am an artist anyway, like, so I immerse myself in my art as well, like, so... Um, but I, I also am an avid gardener and uh, I, I love to spend my time in the garden and I'm lucky enough to have a front and back garden and enjoy the nature and look after the nature around me. Um, so I immerse myself in a little nature every day and I'm starting to learn again now to reap the benefits of my garden again rather than just admire it as we were doing for so many years. Um, I revert back to the way that we can, um, you know, we can benefit from our from our grounds around us as well, and so I've gone back to planting vegetables and uh, fruits again, and um, enjoying this yield again. And it it's it's it just brought me closer again to nature. But I, I am feeling myself my myself much more closer to nature anyway as of late, given you know given the severity of the situation we all face with the climate situation and everything. It makes us focus in on these more important things in life and um, yeah so that, I suppose that would be my response to Kendon anyway so thanks. Um, I, I've been involved in a lot of tree process and so you know part of that is to spend a lot of time in the trees that are going to be cut down. Um, I just thought I'd remind people I expect you know about her um, Jennifer Butterfly Hill, she spent a whole year in a tree um, and you can watch the whole story again or for the first time on YouTube and it's very inspiring. I think even Joan Byers went up into the tree to uh, offer her support. It's, it is a lovely, lovely story. So a lot of the tree activists, um, we've got some uh, not too far outside of London, they're fighting the HS2 uh, development and they're up in the trees. Um, I expect there are people all over America and elsewhere in the trees trying to save trees and they're part of this movement as well. So that might be a good idea to invite them in with the activism. Yeah, thank you for that. Kendon, did you want to step in here? Well, let me say first to Jamin, is that how it's pronounced? Okay. It, exactly, at your service. Thank you, Dr. Kendon. Uh, that I'm the science guy in the crowd, um, and body-mind is definable scientifically, neuroanatomically. And so now that I have your email, I'll get the current version, there's a new version every week, because it's something I've come upon recently, and it's amazing. But backing off just a bit, um, I've left out the formally inspirational part of my talk. Uh, so I was in my 60s, I'm now 85, 
uh, still writing. <laughs> Crazy. Uh, in my 60s, I was doing the mountaintop retreat phase while being a 60 hour a week MD of a workaholic. Um, and the question from the mountaintop was always how do you bring the mountaintop back into the city? And we're talking about. And I, I would ask Michelle if you would put on what I'll call slide A, which is one of us sitting in the redwoods, uh, just being. Thank you. And so there we are in that phase of development, and it's an astonishing phase. And without telling you about decade 30, decade 40, and amazing things, um, presently, the degree to which I experience joy and love, just a part of being, is clearly in a growth phase. And I am so grateful and thankful for that and if you would give us slide b michelle so wherever we are on our journey um same person different angle um we are as i i will assert that all of us are moving forward on our ability to access joy and love as part of being um, is growing. And maybe the horrors are contributing to that. You know, it's a cauldron, it's a, a crucible. Um, but I want to be witness at my vantage point in life that more and more what you see before you there is a way of symbolically expressing what is happening to us. So, thank you. Slide down. <laughs> and then I would ask again, anyone else who might share how you have brought the mountaintop into your home more reliably, dependably, by choice um, to the extent that that resonates for you. Or not. If I may, um, I'm still co-host, so I have no hand raising ability. Um, but I am curious to hear, I, I don't wanna sidestep this very, you know, important and intriguing question you pose, but I'm curious to hear um, if you see, Kendon, a distinction between um, what is called intuition and um, thinking and acting from the body-mind. Because I, yesterday at our open space discussion, just like um, serendipitously, really, someone popped in by accident and before popping out, she was mentioned, um, you know, we're, oh, we're just moving from the age of information into the, the age of intuition. And we're just learning how to, uh, we've just got our training wheels on right now. We're learning how to get around it in this new way. And, and then she went on her way and left and I was like, whoa, that's incredible. I love that. The age of intuition it resonated with me. Um, and I'm, I've been thinking about it since then. And I'm wondering if you might have, uh, a di uh, if there is any intricacies to, um, speak of briefly if possible, <laughs> uh, or if you think it might be saved for another time. Well, I kind of anticipate, uh, doing a dialogue of some kind with the radish crowd on this i'm sure there will be other times uh, the simple answer to your question is uh no difference uh, but one of the and then speaking succinctly uh, that earlier cortex because it doesn't have words it as i say it manifests and it's organized in life every moment you're positioned for your next choice 
by inclinations that you've learned over the 20, 40, 60, 80 years of your life. So the subtlety of how you've learned to make those choices can be extraordinary. And then the interface between thinking mind and implicit self is multiple books and several other authors than me down the road. Um, but if you don't have a sense of self, you don't have thoughts, you don't have memory, you don't have past and future, um, intuition or implicit knowing or, and then one of the things about this holistic knowing is every word you use can be an opening to a further word uh, to capture uh, how that way of being operates. So the message for today is wired into us, we know holistically. And if we practice, we can get better and better at integrating the knowing holistically, implicitly, seat of our pants, with all that we're capable of with that, with knowing from differentiation, with being able to come to conclusions, lists, blah, blah. Very important, very useful. But if it becomes the whole story, you see the devolution of culture that we're all living through. So fairly brief, fairly brief. That was really great, thank you. Um, and I guess to answer the question of bringing the mountaintop into my home, I've I've um, I've got a couple practices that I've been building in my life um, recently. One of them being Hatha Yoga, um, and I've and the other being Feldenkrais. Um, simply, <laughs> simply just moving. Some of us too, yeah. With with extraordinary um, focus within the body, in the body, or not moving at all and just imagining moving parts of my body without actually moving them. It seems to move my mind into a, a very deep place. Um, and with the yoga, um, I, I often like to go out, out in the backyard to do that. Um, and I am left um, through the course and then at the end when I'm resting, um, it's, it's an opening, certainly. But more than just an opening to the senses all around, but it's, it's very much an opening to um, an internal sense that is um, sometimes the most important thoughts um, or the most important, yeah, the things that need to be considered will come up then. Um, or the, the wordless experience and thoughtless experience is what needs to come up and that comes up then. Um, and, and so that's definitely something that I see have developed. Being, being two practices that I see like um, tying the body to the mind in a really powerful way to bring us to spaces when um, a force isn't right near us, right at hand. And the natural world, you know, fresh air, or at least a moving air instead of stagnant air, air that has moved um, is potent. Uh, I'll finish there in case someone else wants to share before we have to pass the torch here in just a moment. Yeah, so we are uh, just got about three minutes left, maybe a little less. So um, does anyone have any urgent um, closing thoughts or messages? Leoma, do you just want to say hello here? Well, I will share something from my late 30s when I came down with a major physical condition I've been dealing with since then. And instead of being able to take long hikes, all of a sudden I could go very small distances. But I discovered on the sidewalk a whole community of insects and creatures I would sit and just watch these tiny ones. 
I discovered a major predator in an itty bitty, itty bitty, bitty, bitty fly with very long front legs, unlike any fly I'd ever seen, that would just sit there and wait till a little itty bitty bitty ant pass by it. And all of a sudden, this long sponge fly tongue, I mean, I know it's a sponge tongue because of studying other flies, would flash down, grab the itty bitty ant. And it was just like this whole, on an open sidewalk, there was this whole community of tiny beans. You know, it's like you've never seen a tiger and all of a sudden, here's a tiger. Or a herd of antelopes and all of a sudden, here's a herd of, you know, it's, um, it was sinking into a different world. Okay, well, I want to um, close us out to honor the timing and spacing and uh, welcome, David. I'm, I'm not sure if you're here for the next session or, uh, but just to, just to wrap us up, um, you can find Nova Sutras online in most of the usual places and uh, one slightly less usual is Insight Timer. We have a few guided meditation recordings there. Um, we are, uh, we booked up all kinds of stuff for this week. <laughs> so we are going to host um, a room in one of the, in the upcoming open space session that starts in an hour. Um, and then also in the one Thursday morning, Thursday afternoon, we're hosting a small ritual and conversation around grief. Um, then Friday, and I have these, yeah, oh, Friday morning, I'll be leading a guided meditation, and Friday afternoon, we'll have another um, kind of a workshop like this, uh, specifically around um, building social skills, essentially. Um, so thank you for joining us for this session on Awakening the Body-Mind with Forest Immersion. Um, do make sure that you put your email in the chat if you want us to follow up with you and we can send you any uh, further information that we want. And um, uh, Kendon has, has offered to share his paper with people who want it. Okay. Make sure you make me a host, um, Michelle. You got it. And there you are. Thank you very much. And then, I'm sorry, were you complete? I just wasn't quite yeah, sure if you that, were. That was, that, was the, that was our wrap up. Okay, terrific. So and now, oh yes, and big hugs to everyone. Ah yes, the hugs. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>